Welcome to the Morphous for Menopause podcast and YouTube show. I'm your host, Andrea Donsky, and I'm the co-founder of wearemorphous.com. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Chris Shade. He's the CEO and founder of Quicksilver Scientific, and we're going to be talking about hormones, specifically BHRT, which is body identical hormones. That's coming up right now. Chris, I am so happy to have you on the Morphous for Menopause podcast. Thanks, Andrea. Great to be here. I'm happy to have you now. I've interviewed you before for the for the summit, our amazing Menopause Shift Summit. And your information was so great that I wanted to have you on the podcast because I want us to really dig deep into bioidentical hormones. And I know that as the founder of Quicksilver Scientific, you sell, you have it on your website, people are able to get it. And I would love to just talk a little bit about, you know, do we need a prescription? We can get it directly from you. Give us a little bit of the backstory. Yeah, uh, prescriptions, you're usually going around compounded hormones and certain forms oral you need prescriptions for. Uh, but those, so let's go back to supplements. So what are you allowed to get over the counter? DHEA and pregnenolone for oral use as a supplement. Then the hormones that aren't allowed for oral use are, as a supplement are testosterone, progesterone, estradiol, estriol, or estrone, so the estrogens. But progesterone and the estrogens can be used as a topical, uh, as a, you know, as a, a beauty cream. And so you can look on the web and, you know, you can go on to, you know, Amazon, you can find estrogen creams. And so we have estrogen and progesterone as topical nano serums. And then we have an oral DHEA and uh, pregnenolone blend. Now, the only thing we haven't talked about here is testosterone. Right. Testosterone is either going to be a prescription cream, it's almost never done oral, uh, except for a sublingual format that we have, but that's only through compounding pharmacies. So it's usually taken as a cream, as an injectable, or as a pellet. But for women, if you get DHEA levels up high enough, that all converts over into testosterone. So the nano DHEA pregnenolone gives you DHEA, pregnenolone, and testosterone. And then the topical progesterone uh, gives you the progesterone. And estrogen, either you're going to make enough for the DHEA or you're going to need a little extra as the topical estradiol or topical estriol. And as we get into this more, we'll talk about uses of estradiol versus estriol. But yeah, okay. it, you can get everything that you need as a female uh, without a prescription. I want to start with DHEA because it is probably the one I, I not, just so everybody knows. And I, if you're following me on TikTok, you know that I've talked about the fact that I've tried BHRT lately. I've been managing all of my symptoms naturally. And when I met Chris, I really wanted to try them just to see what it would feel like and to see if it would make a difference in my numbers. So let's start with the DHEA, Chris. I know that you have my before and afters. I gave you all my numbers. So what was my number? So, so let's talk about what DHEA is. Like, let's put it into perspective for, for women who are listening so they even understand why they should even look at taking DHEA. Yeah, so, so DHEA is the hormone uh, that's known as an adrenal hormone but uh, because it's produced mostly in the adrenals, but uh, it is the precursor to your main sex hormones, uh, progest uh, I mean testosterone and estrogen, but on its own, it is a big regulator of metabolism. Uh, and so with low DHEA, you tend to be more likely to have cardiometabolic problems, blood sugar problems, weight problems. So it's bringing up metabolism, turning on metabolism, it's got huge effects on neurocognitive health, and it is itself uh, an agonist for both androgen receptors and a little bit of, of estrogen receptors. So it acts as an androgen. So androgens would be DHEA, testosterone, your main androgen, uh, androstenediol, diol, and dihydrotestosterone. Those are the more male things, give you drive, uh, and then of course, Estrogens and progesterones are the two other main classes of hormones, but we can't forget the glucocorticosteroids uh, like cortisol. Those are the adrenal 
hormones. So uh, it's thought of as adrenal, and when it, there's adrenal fatigue, you get low DHEA. But it's got this cognitive stuff. It's got metabolic and uh, cardiometabolic effects, and it has effects on the sex receptors. So it's a great one. It's in very high concentrations in the blood. It's you know roughly a uh, thousand times higher than testosterone and progesterone. Uh, so 100 to 1,000 times higher than, than either of those and, you know, vastly, you know, 100,000 times higher than estrogen levels. So it is the dominant circulating hormone and it has all these great effects. What's interesting is that for years I've had my DHA tested and I would get it tested through my blood and it's always been low, always. And I've tried oral, I've tried other oral DHAs over the years. Nothing has been able to move the needle for me. And I remember reading a stat that if your DHA is low, it actually is tied into longevity and you oh. really want very well correlated with longevity for sure low dha you're going to find this uh in elderly uh women and men and uh it's highly correlated with longevity it peaks when you're 25 and by 35 it's already started its decay and it's going down 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 and it has all these great effects and so like in yourself we have your we have i have your numbers here your dha uh, before supplementation was 1.6 micromole per liter. In the U.S., we look at microliter, uh, micrograms per deciliter. So in U.S. numbers, you're 59. That's really, really low. Uh, yep. You know, I like, you know, people to be uh, above 300, like 300, 5, even 600. So after supplementation in... And hold on, uh, before you give the number, I'm yeah. just going to, I just want to prep, I just want to set this up for a second. So... I have been getting, so like I said, I've been testing my DHA for years. I cannot even remember, Chris, that it was, I don't even remember back, even like in perimenopause, like probably within the last 10 years, I can't even remember a, a point where it was in the range. Okay. So let's keep that number one thought. And because, you know, for those of you who are listening to our podcast, you know that I'm a big N of one tester. You know that I'm always testing on myself and, and doing, doing what I can to find out, you know, what works, what doesn't. And I tried other, like I said, I tried other forms of DHA, taking them to see if it moved the needle. Nothing, nothing, nothing moved the needle. So I met Chris and I took the DHA from Chris. So for those of you who are watching us on YouTube, Quicksilver Scientific, they have, this is the smaller one. You have a really big one as well. And I started taking it. The dosage on the label says to take one teaspoon. I've been taking a half teaspoon. So I, I'm just setting this up because ladies, this is crazy. Wait till you hear the difference. So I took it for, I think it was six or seven weeks. So Chris, you gave me, you gave my number before. What was my number after? So your 1.6 uh, micromolar, you went to 10.9. In US units, that's going from 59 micrograms per deciliter to 401. That is an wow. awesome, awesome level. And we've done uptake studies. And uh, in these, these are little nano emulsion particles of DHEA, and they absorb right through the oral cavity into circulation. You can see them come up in the blood in a couple of minutes, and you see the DHEA levels rise and because of the nature of this delivery, that it's not metabolized first in the liver, it's turned instantly into, or a fraction of it is turned instantly into testosterone. So you see the testosterone levels rise right with the DHEA. So now you're in a range for DHEA that's above a lot of people's reference range, but it's like really where we like to be in the hormone supplementation community and of A4M and AMMG. You know, we've learned from guys like Terry Hertog, you know, there is no max level for this stuff. So oh, 400 okay. is just a rocking level. I mean, I see people in the six, you know, even 700, but 400, you are just super solid. And when we look at your testosterone, your testosterone went from undetectable. It was less than 0 0.4 in uh, as a nanomole. And then it went up to, zero, uh, to 1.2 nanomole. So in our U.S. equivalents, you were less than 11.5 nanograms per deciliter. That could mean maybe you were five, and you went up to 34. So that's a really, that's really in a nice range, and that's about what we expect for that half teaspoon dose. You know, if you did the full teaspoon dose, your DHA would probably be around 600, and your testosterone would probably be 60, even 70. You know, it would be twice these levels that you're getting now. But those are super, he uh, super healthy levels that you have there. 
And that didn't take long. I mean, like I said, it was six, uh, it, seven it, weeks. They would be there. I, yeah, I know. But you just think it took that many. If I had tested you the next day, they it would have been up. That. Yep. Uh, now, the effects you don't feel for a couple of days, you know? So, like, you know, you take a woman who's got low libido, no testosterone, stuff, you inject her, she, her levels are up in a, in a couple of days, but her libido doesn't come up for about seven to ten days. And huh. so the processes work slowly, but these levels go up right away. So, number one, DHEA, it's, you know, adrenals. It helps with it helps with energy, right? Like I'm thinking, I have so much energy. So, uh, women who are listening right now, one one of the main complaints we get from women in perimenopause and menopause is they have no energy. Will this help them? Oh, absolutely. You know, you you know, you're a high vata type. You know, you're a mind type. People who don't have a mind that flutters like that, you know, their body will drop down. They'll be really tired. They can't lose weight because the metabolism's not up. DHA is driving metabolism. It's bringing up mitochondrial strength. It's bringing up your ability to burn fats and, and carbohydrates, that metabolic flexibility. Uh, it's getting rid of insulin resistance. So all the energy will start expressing itself a lot better. Okay, so it helps with energy. Um, so you mentioned metabolism and insulin resistance. So DHA has an effect on that? Yes, yes, very much so. It's, you know, low DHA, high metabolic dysfunction, especially with age. Uh, neurocognitive, low DHA, high neurocognitive uh, deficits. Explain what you mean by neurocognitive so everybody understands. Uh, memory, cognition, you know, foggy brain, uh, processing speed. Those are all inversely related to DHA. So as DHA goes down, uh, processing speed goes down, memory goes down, clarity goes down. Interesting. So having that proper and being in that proper range, like you said, which is higher than what's necessarily written in that it's supposed to be in that range, then it's completely, like you said, safe. And there is no level that is too high just so I, i'm repeating again no so we haven't you'll see symptomatically people when they're taking tablets of dhea and i believe this is because it has to go through first pass metabolism into the liver and there's a lot of meta androgenic metabolites that come out that we're not necessarily testing for in the blood but then they'll uh, have androgenic symptoms like uh, a little bit of facial hair, not like me, but a little bit of facial hair, acne, uh, those kind of things. But we've never seen that with with this delivery where it goes right into the blood as the DHEA form, uh, not the sulfated form, and it doesn't make all these metabolites in the liver. I mean, eventually you're going to metabolize it out, but it's not just hitting the liver right away and because people do report those symptoms from large larger doses of DHEA. They're not getting to where they want before they're having negative symptoms. We're getting up to where we have all the energy and, you know, sexual energy is coming along with DHEA. DHEA is helping other aspects of your neuroendocrine system, like high DHEA is helping with thyroid function and people who have uh, you know, maybe uh, hypothyroid or even Hashimoto's, the DHEA uh, can often move you out of those syndromes. So would you recommend that people start with your DHA with, so I started with the half a teaspoon. Do yeah. you recommend that we start with a lower dose and then increase to a teaspoon? Because I kind of just stayed at the half a teaspoon. So for everyone who's listening, should that be a goal to get to that one teaspoon a day? I think it's a good thing to start with a half, see how you feel, then go to a hole, see how you feel. For some people, maybe it's a little too stimulating. They're a little like, eh. Then go back to a half. You can even do a quarter. You're going to have really good levels. In right. hormones, we always say don't treat the numbers, treat the symptoms. Right. And the numbers are a guide. And, you know, we could see why, where we move the needle with you, uh, especially for things like estrogen, you know, if we're off the reservation one way or another. We have those as a guide, but you're dosing up to where you feel best. And then you're recording those numbers and saying, this is a range that works for me. And you're remembering that number for you because in hormones, there's the hormone effect is produced by two things, the level in the blood and the density in your system of the hormone receptors. So if you have a ton of testosterone receptors and a low to moderate level of testosterone, you might have a good testosterone response. But if you have only a couple of testosterone receptors, you're going to need a high level in the blood 
to activate the system, get the drive, the libido, the focus that you want. And, you know, one of the things that's in this system is one of the ways to increase receptor density is with adaptogenic herbs like ginsengs and, uh, and, and similar ones. So in this DHEA+, Plus, we have maca, famed South American adaptogen for harmonizing hormones. And we have Guai, the famous Chinese, uh, often called female ginseng, and a fermented Korean ginseng. So the Donghuai and the ginseng is working to elevate your density of hormone receptors and uh, and the maca and even the Donghuai are helping to just harmonize all those, uh, all those transitions because hormones all start as cholesterol. And then cholesterol becomes pregnenolone, pregnenolone becomes progesterone and uh, and uh, adrenal hormones, Preg uh, pregnenolone can go down and become DHEA and the sex hormones. It all cascades through. And there's, you know, dozens of different hormone intermediates and you need the system to like hand them off and transform them. And that's one of the things that the adaptogens do is harmonize that. And when you look at adaptogen structure, all hormones have the same backbone of these six member rings. There's three six member and one five member ring. And every hormone has that same ring and all the adaptogens have that same core too. And what's different is what's on the outside of those rings. And that makes it estrogen versus testosterone. The molecules are really close, uh, but hormones are really made, you know, in nature to fit in. I'm sorry, adaptogens are made in nature to fit into the hormone system. That's why they've been the backbone of longevity medicine for, you know, 10,000 years. I was actually going to allude to your formula because it has, you know, it has the pregnenolone, pregnenolone as well, and it has DIM. So, I mean, I always say you're a master formulator, and that's why I love your products because you understand how things work together. Yeah, so there you've got two hormones. You've got pregnenolone, which is your master hormone. It can go become adrenal, can become whatever you need. It just gets drawn in. And then DHEA is driving these sex hormones. And then you've got DIM and chrysin is nutraceuticals. DIM is helping the metabolism of the estrogens into their, you know, to keep it out of the negative estrogen metabolites into the more beneficial estrogen metabolites. So that DIM really drives that. That's always been known for that. Uh, and then uh, chrysin is helping you from making too much uh, estrogen. So estrogen's the one thing we want a little bit more control of. We definitely need it. People get much too afraid of it, but it is the one that has the negative effects. And whereas testosterone and DHA aren't going to have that, none of these pro-cancerous effects. So we're trying to hold a little bit more into testosterone and add estrogen as we need it. And then, so you have the hormones, you have the nutraceuticals, and then you have the three adaptogens, uh, the maca, the donghuai, and the ginseng. So would you need to take adaptogenic herbs on top of taking your DHEA since they already it already has many of them in there? We don't have to. You know, the thing with adaptogens is you can stack them on and it's just additive effect. It's just better. But this is a nice adaptogenic base. So you're set if you're not doing adaptogens separately. Yeah, I guess where my question would be is, do we have to take adaptogens? You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this has you covered if you're taking on them, a base say. level. You can, maybe you want to up the game a little bit more, but you don't need to. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, just to recap too, so the DHA helps to make testosterone. So a lot of women are asking their doctors to prescribe them testosterone because we, we know that testosterone, like you said, can help with that focus, testosterone with the drive and the focus, but also testosterone can help with libido. So if we're taking your DHEA, then you don't necessarily need to take testosterone on top of that, right? Or like no. explain that. Okay. No, you don't. Uh, especially if you're taking the half to one teaspoon doses, you'll have plenty of testosterone. If you're only using a little bit, you might need, and because some people all of a sudden, they'll look at the reference range for DHEA, and we're like, oh my God, we're above the range, we're at the top of the range. No, that's too much. DHEA, that's no problem. So you go a little super physiologic on DHEA, and testosterone will go up to the top of the ref reference range, and you won't need no. any other testoster testosterone supplementation. So how often should we test? So for example, if I, you know, continue, I, I've been taking the DHEA nonstop, 
is it a good idea? It, will it keep, keep going up? Will my testosterone, if I'm staying it? Okay, so explain that because I, I think I've, it's important. Yeah, I, I mean, this is the thing. And then people are like, oh, let me stop and test in a month. You'll be back down to where you were before you came into this program in 24 to 48 hours. Okay. And when you start again, you'll be back up to where you're going to be in 24 to 48 hours. Now, I tracked a number of women, including many that you know, uh, that work with me, and I tracked them over two to three years. Mm -hmm. And their levels just kind of went like this. They didn't keep going up. I mean, two years later, you're almost exactly the level you were when you started, as long as you're at the same dose. Okay. That's good to know. Well, that's important information because that's what I was thinking. I'm like, oh, is it just going to keep going up? Or no, it okay. just attains a steady state and it just rolls like that. Next, I want to move on to your estradiol. I know that this is a, a newer product for you. I have, uh, it was a sample here that I have here. So talk about the topical estradiol. Can you get a topical estradiol bottle? Uh, so the topical estradiol, we use these nano serums for the progesterone and the estradiol, and then we will have coming very shortly as trial. And so we'll have to discuss dial versus trial. Yes. Uh, so the topical estradiol, uh, you know, what I postmenopausal, uh, we usually want a little extra estrogen on top of what's formed from the DHEA. And I like to keep women in the sort of 25 to 40 range. If they have any uh, breast cancer fears or history, then we keep them a little closer to 20. Without any supplementation, they tend to run, you know, like sort of 14 and below. And yeah, you without any estradiol supplementation were less than 11 picograms per mil or less than 40 picomolar. And then when you went on it, you were 21.3 picograms per mil or 78 picomolar. So that 21, I mean, that's good. You know, I might bring it up a little, but you know, like, you know, I want to see like 25, 30, but the 21 is great. You're starting to have the effects in the system. Estradiol's biggest one, uh, well, all right, estradiol, let's, let's go on uh, the symptoms that it works yes. on. So hot flashes are a big one. Sometimes you'll get rid of hot flashes just with progesterone, but you usually need estradiol too. Now, what are the big ones it's known for? So skin thickness, people think about that. Your skin thins out. Think of old ladies with very thin skin, that's estradiol, the thickness, the richness to it. Uh, brain, mood, memory, that is estradiol, and in fact, in some of the studies that were done over in Stanford, estradiol was able to help with memory, whereas Premarin, which is horse estrogens, was not able to. This is the product, there it is, estradiol plus, and it is 0.2 uh, milligrams per pump. And people will do one to two pumps, one to two times a day. Here they're trying to get to an ideal level. So, all right, we talked about skin thickness, brain, mood, memory, sexual health. It's a really big one. All pelvic floor dysfunction is related, or almost all of it is related to estrogen levels. And so this includes sex sexual health. The biggest complaint there is vaginal dryness often called vaginal atrophy. And so uh, UTIs also go with that, and all the pelvic floors, including prolapse of the, of the pelvic uh, area, all that dropping and drying out is an estrogen-related thing. Now, here's where we're gonna talk about uh, estradiol versus estriol. And actually, let me just hit the others in the list for estradiol. Bone health, it's a big one. So preventing osteoporosis, uh, estradiol is big for that. And heart and cardiovascular health, there's a lot of cardio protection uh, involved in estradiol. But now let's go back to the pelvic floor disorders. <clears throat> Up here, it's estradiol receptors that are really, the estrogen receptors respond to estradiol. But then you convert in the liver estradiol to estriol. So people talk about E1, that's estrone, that's not a very effective estrogen. Estradiol, that's E2, that's the most potent estrogen. 
And then S-triol E3, that's three hydroxyl groups, is one that is not so potent on receptors up here, but the urinary tract receptors and the vaginal tract receptors are all for S-triol. And you're going to turn the estradiol to S-triol in the liver and then export it out of the liver down to the kidneys and you're going to pee it out. So you're actually peeing out the estrogen that's stimulating the receptors in the urinary tract and in the vaginal walls. So estriol is often used as a vulval topical or if it's you know coming out of a compounding pharmacy an intravaginal and is directly helping urinary tract disorders, vaginal dryness and atrophy and all the pelvic floor disorders. And so women who are afraid of breast cancer issues with estradiol might take a smidge of estradiol and a bunch of estriol and they get all the pelvic floor help from the estriol. So right now we have the estradiol and about two months we'll have estriol as more of a vulva topical. And so then you can work it out so you know you're getting a nice toning of the vaginal and urinary tract by using excess estriol and just enough estradiol to uh, manage other symptoms. So uh, the estriol, or I, I thought it was estriol. I guess it's estriol. The proper I'm, name. I'm, or, yeah, most tomato, people say tomato. estriol, but estradiol. So estrone is one OH, estradiol yeah. is two OHs, estriol is three OHs. You know that pronunciation is just making you see this is these are Got just it. breakdown uh, products. Perfect. And uh, so just to be clear then, so the, and you could use, so you, you alluded to it, you said that you can use a little bit of estradiol with the estriol or as- Yeah, that's the formulation in creams, that's called biest. Biest, okay. And if they do triest, that's estrone, estradiol, and estriol. I don't see the need for the estrone though. And for, for your products though, because triest, that's a, that's a medication, right? Like that's an actual um, prescription. Is that, or is that just a, a term for the, it? That's, the, I know compounding pharmacies, the compounding yeah. pharmacies that make this up and you have a prescription for it, will do, you know, a monoest, a biest or a triest. Got it. But because they're topicals, most of them, it doesn't necessarily have to be with the prescription. Now, if that was an injectable, it would. And if it was an oral, it would, but for the estrogens, topicals are the most common, uh, the most common way that you apply estrogens. So, when it comes to the estriol, um, it's going to be a cream that you can literally, so kind of like you would get from your compounding pharmacist, that you're going to put it on your finger and then you're going to apply to the vulval vulva area. Is right. So okay. with us, uh, I wonder how I'm going to put this on a piece of paper. With these nano serums, it's, you'll see, it's a clear, it's totally dissolved. So people talk about micronized hormones. All those hormone creams are finely ground hormones suspended in a cream base. They're not truly dissolved in the cream. Okay. And some of that is dragged in to absorption with the cream. So their doses tend to be a lot higher than the doses that we're using with these nano serums. See, that's transparent. That yeah. means it is truly dissolved into these little nano bubbles of oil that are in there and it absorbs super fast and uh, very efficiently. Very efficient. So it's applied topically. Yes. And now, so let's go in terms, let's talk about in terms of where to apply it. So you're talking about, you're saying the estradiol receptors are up here. So when you're putting on your estradiol cream, is it on the upper part of your body and specific areas? Generally, I mean, you can go on the inner arms, the inner thighs, the abdomen, uh, all those areas are really good. Uh, you, you can go vulval with it, but you know, those receptors aren't really tuned for that. Right. Uh, and so when you go to the, the triol or the estriol, then that vulval topical approach is really nice because then you're close to where all the receptors are. And um, should you mix in, like, should you one day you do it over here, the next day you do it over here? And yeah, you it's good to yeah. rotate it around okay. so you don't create any like contact allergy to, uh, okay. to the cream. So it's the contact allergy yeah. that's the concern, not that's that it's, usually, it's yeah. accumulating. Okay. That's good yeah, I mean, I've heard with uh, with a lot of people using creams like testosterone creams that they'll start growing hair on their arms. 
uh, because so much of it is low, it's not penetrating in. It's so topical. And then there's transference problems. So, you know, if you're a mother, you don't want to do those compounded creams on your inner arms and then hug your kids and all this estrogen goes across. Uh, with the nano serums, you, you leave very little uh, on the surfaces. You know, it's funny you say that. I was very specific in terms of when I was applying it that I made sure that I washed my hands after and that my yeah. hands, but you're saying it's I don't necessarily have to do that. It, it, with yeah, your it's, no, it's nowhere near it's like the amounts in there are much higher in these white creams and the amounts of residue okay. left are vastly higher. That's why you hear about the dogs going into heat, you know, from sitting right. on the laps of their mom after the testosterone or uh, or, or, or the estrogen and uh and so there's a lot of stories of transference. Well, I think it's an important thing to mention, especially for <laughs> those like women the who dog are... went into heat. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's important to mention because it's not something we might think about, right? I mean, I have an 11 year old, and you know, I always like to cuddle with her before bed, and it was something that I remember hearing yeah. possibly from you or somebody else that, that told me to do that. So totally happens. Cool. Interesting. Okay, so your estriol will be will be available in a few months, and then you know, it's it's funny. I had had um, because of dryness, and that would probably I'd say. Now, like with with even with all my natural remedies, it's the one thing that I find has been, you know, tough to um, to help. And there is there is a specific supplement that I was taking, and I stopped because I I'm trying things all the time, right? Oh, but the estrogen just poof, done. <laughs> it's it's really tough with dryness. And I was just talking to a woman the other day, actually, that was saying she was having a lot of trouble with it too, and she was doing coconut oil, and nothing was helping her. So I that's why I emailed coconut you. Coconut oil like, doesn't increase the secretions from inside, and that the hard thing with the oils is lubricant sexually is the the natural lubrication is a water-based lubrication and then the oils are oil-based and it can sort of like turn into a cream instead of being smooth and slippery that's why you have things like ky that are water-based but if you get the estrogen levels up you will never have vaginal dryness okay so and your estriol so how many how often do you apply it is it a couple times a week is it every day oh uh, you do it every day you can do it every day you know, these one metabolize out over the course of 24 hours and so, you know, once to twice a day, you figure out what works for you, uh, you know, and maybe you're doing, you know, one pump of estradiol, you know, wherever you put it, you can put it all in the same place if you want. And, you know, two pumps of estriol, you know, and, you know, if you're just doing it once a day, you're going to do more. Uh, but, you know, the estriol is very forgiving. Okay. And you repeat again, you were saying for women who were worried about um, it's linked to certain issues like cancer, you were saying. So, so estrogen dependent cancers are working with estradiol, not estriol. Estriol goes to different receptors. And, you know, it has the weak estrogen activity, you know, up here and it will help the brain, but it'll never go after the estrogen uh, sensitive cancer receptors. That's only estradiol does that. Now, before we go on, I, and I'm thinking because I'm so used to this, I want to make sure that everybody is um, understands the difference between like HRT and BHRT because if they did, they weren't at the summit, and perhaps they are they're listening to this for the very first time on the Morphous for Menopause podcast. Just let's back up for one second before we go into progesterone. Yeah, so hormone replacement versus bioidentical hormone replacement. So what do we mean by bioidentical? It means when I have an estradiol molecule or a DHEA molecule or a progesterone molecule in these creams or orals, they are exactly the same molecule as the one that's in your body. It's bioidentical. Why would it ever not be? Well, remember drug companies can only create a drug out of something they're gonna spend a lot of money on, so therefore they need to patent it before they spend all this money on approving it as a drug. And so what they were doing, especially in the 70s and 80s, is synthesizing hormone analogs. Like it's almost like progesterone, but then it's got like a weird arm sticking out of it. And they they screen through compounds and make sure they have strong action on the receptor they're going after. But what would happen is these progestins would have strong action on one receptor they're looking at, but no, none of the other things that progesterone does. Progesterone 
has all of these effects on the brain. It has effect, uh, effects on the liver, like very beneficial effects. It has effects on detoxification rates, great effects. Those progestins don't do any of those things. And so the orchestra of what a hormone does is cut short by these synthetics. Then you have like Premarin, estrogen isolated from horse urine. And, <laughs> and uh, and so there are some, there is some estradiol in there, but then there's all these other metabolites and there's horse hormones. Uh, I forget, Carol Peterson used to talk about what they were. It's equa, like equus, equa, you know, equadiol or something like that. And so you got horse hormones that you don't even have a system for metabolizing. And they start building up and, and she said they could find levels of these horse hormones in women ages after they stopped taking Premarin because the system that would metabolize out the estradiol isn't metabolizing out these horse hormones. And so we want human bioidentical hormones and that's what the bioidentical means. And then, you know, where are these sourced from? Here's where there's a lot of misconception. People will be like, oh, I want wild yam progesterone, and I want estrogen from wild yams, as if wild yams have so much estrogen in them that we can harvest it out of there. That's not actually how it goes. You have a precursor to all the hormones in there called diastenin that is easy for the chemist to work with to synthesize hormones that are identical to your hormones. So the diastrogen might come from wild yam, it might come from soy, might come from another plant source, and then they're synthesized into forms that are identical to your forms, and that's what bioidentical hormone replacement means. Is there research on BHRT or bioidentical hormones? Because if you speak to some people, like I remember when I was talking to um, one of my doctors about it, and she was saying, well, she doesn't prescribe BHRT, although I know a lot of um, certain now uh, hormones are BHRT, but she was saying that she wasn't specifically knowledgeable about it. Talk a little bit about the medical community and BHRT, because I just don't want there to be any confusion. Well, there is confusion because they have their heads up their proverbial arses uh, around BHRT. There's a ton of research around BHRT, you know, and then you'll see these panels from the government, well, we don't think it's reproducible and, you know, we don't think this and that. And it's just, they're just, just listening to pharma industry propaganda that, hey, we've got it all worked out. Don't do this compounding stuff. But compounded hormones have been here for decades and there is a lot of research on compounded bioidentical hormones. That's where I found all the research on DHEA and progesterone and estrogen. Uh, it's not It's not like the data isn't out there. It's not like the guidance isn't out there. And there's really, especially when the doctors get into these professional programs like A4M, AMMG, they're really learning what forms people are using, what's working, and you know, there's decades of practice behind it, and there's a lot of literature. Okay, finally, I want to talk about progesterone. Now, I know you have your progesterone. It's right over here. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, just a minute ago about some of the benefits. So talk about the benefits and also why yours is so great. Yeah, progesterone is one of these great things. Uh, you know, my dear friend Carol Peterson recommends it for everything. Like, if there's a problem, the answer is progesterone. Progesterone, you know, we think of testosterone and estrogen as being these opposites, but really in the female world, the opposites are estrogen and progesterone. And estrogen is more stimulating, and progesterone is more calming. Estrogen in the brain stimulates glutamate receptors, which uh, give you attention and focus, but they also give you anxiety. And so when you're estrogen dominant, uh, and there's a whole period in perimenopause where uh, progesterone falls off faster than estrogen, and you have a relative estrogen dominance, that's why there's so much irritability and anxiety and uncomfortableness. And you give those women a little bit of progesterone, and it's just like, <sighs> because the opposite, of glutamate in the brain is GABA. 
and progesterone metabolites stimulate the GABA receptors to be more receptive to the GABA, so it creates a GABA-like effect. So progesterone is for calming, anxiolytic activity, sleep. It is amazing for sleep. These perimenopausal women who haven't slept a full night in ages, you give them a little progesterone and they're down for the count. In the liver, estrogen blocks up your liver and progesterone opens it up and increases bioflow. All detoxification requires bioflow. All the toxins leaving the body through the liver are leaving with the bile. And when you stop flowing the bile, you stop flowing the toxins out. Plus, progesterone is a cofactor to upregulate the genes for detoxification. There's a receptor called the pregnane X receptor, responds to pregnenolone and progesterone. In women, it's more progesterone. Uh, so it has all these different effects. Uh, it's a strong anti-inflammatory. It's used a lot when there's TBI, any kind of inflammation in the brain, it calms all that down. Uh, so we get a lot of use of progesterone. And one of the ones uh, there was, I think his name was Michael Platt, wrote a book on adrenaline excess. And these are you know type A, jacked up people. And the antidote for that is progesterone. It really brings things down let your body heal and, you know, get into uh, a better space. And in fact, for men even, progesterone uh, is amazing for sleep. It makes, you know, men more calm, less irritable, uh, deals with the high adrenaline situations, and it deals with prostate inflammation as well by blocking excess DHT formation. How much progesterone should we be taking? So in our system... Uh, those droppers there, each dropper full is eight milligrams. And that seems like not a lot compared to, you know, when you're taking a capsule, you have like a hundred milligrams, but you're metabolizing most of that away. So uh, we're using one to three droppers a day. And, you know, maybe it depends what their native levels are and what their symptoms are. If these are, you know, high strung people and they have anxiety during the day, you do one dropper in the morning and two at night. Uh, some people just the two at night or even one a night is, is enough. You're going to, you know, take it, try more until you're getting the effect that you want. If you get too much, you're going to be groggy the next day. So you're doing, let's say one to two pumps of your estrogen. And then you're yeah. going to do, is it still only three dropper fulls or would you have to increase it if you're no, doing no, no, pumps? no, that's, that's, that's enough to, you, you know, to go against the, uh, the estrogen. Okay, so one to three drop. Sorry, three dropper fulls of progesterone. One to three dropper. One to three dropper fulls. Uh, in general, if you're taking, say, you're taking two estrogen twice a day, you're going to be at least two to three dropper fulls then. To balance okay. that. And if you're just doing and just so one if pump. people don't know, estrogen is stimulating thickening of the lining of the uterus, and progesterone is thick is thinning that back out. And that's how it works. When you cycle, you have high estrogen, and then the high progesterone comes in, prepares the lining of the uterus, and then sheds it. So for women who are in perimenopause, then they should be taking the progesterone. And then for women who are in menopause, they should take the estrogen with the progesterone. Yes, unless you're seeing in perimenopause that your estrogen's way too low and you're experiencing thinning and dryness and stuff, then take both. But for most women, if they've still got enough estrogen in perimenopause, they need the progesterone really bad. Then postmenopause, they need both. Okay. Okay. Um, very interesting. So now I'm going to just say one thing when I tried the estrogen, and this is why I wanted to interview you again is because I, it, I did the 0.25. So I did one pump a day in the morning and I found that I ended up having night sweats. And so your reply to me, and I wasn't even taking close to even a dropper full of the progesterone. I was doing, I think six drops, not one, not like one to three dropper full. So you were saying that it's because I wasn't taking enough progesterone. Yeah. Yep, that's almost always the problem is not balancing those two. More progesterone, and if that doesn't do it for you, you're still having sweats, you need to bring up the estradiol. If I'm having the night, so yeah, okay. So in my case, I didn't have You have progesterone up, and it's usually when you're getting hot flashes. It could be at night or during the day, but that wave of hot flash, then you need more estradiol. Okay, I'm going to try it again, actually. And do you recommend that women always test, like to test before and then test after, or like to, to have some type of an idea of where their hormones are at? It's good to have an idea. Uh, and, you know, even if you're just testing after and you're like, I feel great now, and then you measure that, uh, you've got that snapshot of these are the levels 
and this is where I should stay. Now you have to test in the right time frame because okay. like you do uh, a dose of DHEA at 8 a.m. in the morning and by 8 a.m. the next morning, it's totally gone. For DHEA, we like to measure it four to six hours, actually for all of them, four to six hours after dosing. That's interesting. So it doesn't accumulate, it comes out of your body and within, okay, that's interesting to know too. And I love the fact that it comes in a glass container because the estriol that I had uh, compounded came in like this aluminum tube. And I'm like, I'm not like, who knows how long it was sitting there. I'm like, I'm not. I know the, pla the plastic tubes. Well, plastic they use, was another And the one. creams oh, are pulling plasticizer out of the plastic tubes and stuff. And it's like, guys, yeah. stay away from the, you know, the endocrine. Uh, disrupting the endocrine hormones, disruptor. like chemicals. Yeah. yeah. Disrupting yeah. chemicals. Yeah, that's what that was the first thing that came to mind. I mean, listen, I, I've been in this industry for 22 years. So that it would come to mind for me because I'm like, yeah, like we know that, you know, again, there's certain things that we're being exposed to that can cause other issues. So let's try to stay, keep it as clean as possible. So I love the fact that it's in a dark, a dark bottle, which means that light's not getting to it. It's, it's, it's in glass, which is great. Just before we go, you mentioned several times the word nano. What is like, how is that in reference to what? Oh, your products are? yeah. And so with our delivery systems, the oral ones, uh, we're doing liposomes and nano emulsions. Liposomes are for water solubles. Nano emulsions are for fat solubles or alcohol solubles. And when we talk about nano, it's a size of the vesicle, either the emulsion oil droplet or the liposome vesicle. And nano is below 100 nanometers. And there's certain size ranges that optimize absorption into the system. And uh, in the nano range, uh, you get an optimum absorption, whether it's intraoral absorption or topical absorption. Uh, and that is a differentiator from these creams where, like I said, you have micrometer sized uh, particles of hormone suspended in creams and little bits of them get a, get dissolved and sort of dragged in with the cream uh, versus these uh, type of nano serums where everything just goes in. It doesn't leave a residue on the outside. Okay. Chris, thank you so much. And it, can people, so tell everyone where they can go to find out more. And do you have an excellent customer service department that if women have questions or they want to ask it, you know, find we out do. more? We do. So quicksilverscientific.com, you can go, you can buy direct from us. Uh, you can call with any questions or email support at Quicksilver Scientific. And we have a great customer ex experience department and they will get the answers to you. They'll often come to Mindy and the education team or Diane and the clinical team. Uh, and we have uh, you know, we've, we've got a naturopath, an acupuncturist, a, a pharmacist with 30 years in women's bioidentical hormones. That's Carol. And you got me and you got Mindy. And so there's lots of knowledge bank here on how to use all these products. And like I said, we had these products for a long time before we released them. We were, were, we were making these internally for two to three years before we released them. So we have a lot of practice with them. And I'm so happy that I can, rec because I adore you, I adore Mindy. I think, you know, your company's amazing. And it makes me happy that I can actually recommend a product that I stand behind 100% and also that I've tried myself. So thank you for doing what you're doing. And, and everybody, just so you know, Chris and Mindy were generous to give everybody who listens to our podcast 10% off. So you can use the code MENOPAUSE10 when you check out at quicksilverscientific.com. And if you want to try them, I highly recommend trying them. I mean, like I said, the DHA is literally, I'm still in shock. I'm like, whoa, what a difference. It's unbelievable. And you'll feel so much better because everyone has, you know, women just aren't feeling so great at this point, especially with, you know, their, their energy levels and, you know, for their hormones, if there's ways that we can help them, you know, it's great. Yeah. You know? And, it, you know, it's, I talked about neurocognitive, but along with that is just confidence. Like, I feel good in my skin again. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm thinking. And uh, to come back like that from this area where you're unsure of yourself and you're anxious and you're like just feeling bad, not just tired, just feeling bad and bad about yourself, but to come up and have strength again and confidence again is what women seem to love the most. I love that. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. I appreciate it. And of course, everyone who's watching, speak to your doctors too. If you have more questions about hormones, you want to ask your doctors a question and um, that's it. Chris, thank you. 
Well, there you have it. Lots of information about hormones, BHRT, uh, estriol, estradiol, progesterone, and DHEA. And of course, always speak to your doctor before starting any hormone therapy. If you want to learn more, you can show your doctor this interview because it was so informative. Chris is a scientist and um, an amazing formulator. So I would highly recommend sharing this interview with your healthcare provider, your doctor, and anyone else who wants to understand taking hormones to help them through their menopausal transition. As always, I appreciate you. Thank you for spending the last hour with us and uh, continue to listen to the More Fits for Menopause podcast and share it with everyone you know, because the more you share shows you care. Thanks for watching. Be well.